Hey everybody, welcome back to Biochemistry Lecture. We're talking about RNA metabolism this time. We are going to cover sections 1 through 3, not going to cover section 4. It's kind of going to be like an appetizer sampler. We're going to jump around a bit. Before we get started, we're going to introduce a little bit of vocabulary. So, ribozymes, you may have heard of this before, it's a catalytic RNA that acts like an enzyme. So it is a nucleic acid that can perform chemistry. Then there are ribonucleoproteins, or RNPs. These are complexes that have RNAs as well as proteins. We're going to talk about transcription today. And this is the process where we have this whole big enzyme system that converts genetic information from your double-stranded DNA into an RNA strand with a complementary base sequence. We covered the major types of RNA molecules a few chapters ago, but this is just a refresher. There's messenger RNA, which is abbreviated mRNA, and that encodes the amino acid sequences of polypeptides, aka the proteins in your body. There's transfer RNAs, or tRNAs, and these read the mRNA, and they transfer the appropriate amino acid to that chain that's growing during protein synthesis. We've got ribosomal RNAs, which are part of ribosomes, and ribosomes are the machinery that actually synthesize proteins. So you can see here that RNA has a really big role in a lot of the metabolic processes of the body. There's also non-coding RNAs, or NC RNAs, and they have a variety of functions. They could be catalytic, structural, regulatory, so there's, it's a pretty broad um, type. When we talk about the cellular transcriptome, we're talking about all the RNA molecules that are produced in a cell under a given set of conditions. About three quarters of the human genome is transcribed into RNA. And the majority of those products are non-coding RNAs which you probably would think that it would be mRNA, not the case. There are lots of RNAs that do lots of different functions outside of just becoming protein. The entire chromosome is copied during replication, but with transcription, we're a bit more selective. So that's why you see only a part of the genome is transcribed, or excuse me, um, yes, transcribed. So here are the key principles. As always, read through them. Make sure that you can kind of expand on these ideas because these are the central ideas that you see throughout the chapter. We're going to start with DNA-dependent synthesis of RNA. RNA is synthesized by RNA polymerases. And just as an FYI, there's going to be a lot of similarities between DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases in terms of the types of um, functions that they have. And as a whole, looking at transcription and um, looking at transcription of the genome is going to be a very similar process to DNA replication. So DNA-dependent RNA polymerase catalyzes transcription. And what it requires to do this is a DNA template, of course, the ribonucleoside triphosphates. So remember, there's UTP and, of course, magnesium. RNA pole adds ribonucleotide units to the 3' prime hydroxyl end, builds the RNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. It should sound pretty familiar, very similar to DNA replication. Similarly, the reaction that is catalyzed by RNA polymerase is the same. We have two magnesium ions that have the same role as the magnesium ions in DNA polymerases. You've got a magnesium ion that 
enables this 3 prime hydroxyl to become a better nucleophile and attack the alpha phosphorus in that phosphate, the triphosphate. We've got a second magnesium ion that stabilizes the pyrophosphate here. So it stabilizes it when the nucleotide binds, and then it also stabilizes the diphosphate as a leaving group. Nucleotides are added, and they do the whole Watson-Crick base pairing interactions, just like DNA. We're going to talk about bacterial um, transcription, and then we'll bring it back around to eukaryotic, just like we talked about DNA uh, replication in the same way. So overall, you're lengthening your RNA by one nucleotide at a time, and you're releasing pyrophosphate. Just like with DNA replication, that pyrophosphate is then cleaved to make two individual phosphate um, molecules, and that energy release helps to guide or helps to fuel the energy cost of making this nucleic acid. We have the same stages of transcription as we do uh, DNA replication. So there's initiation, elongation, termination. But the mechanisms are a little bit different. So initiation occurs when the RNA pole binds at a promoter, a mo promoter sequence, but promoters are not actually required. During elongation, you've got the RNA growing it's temporarily base paired with the DNA template and it forms a short hybrid RNA DNA double helix. Eventually that uh, interaction goes away. We don't have that RNA DNA hybrid anymore and you've got this nascent RNA strand just kind of hanging out. As the RNA polymerase moves along the DNA and makes that RNA, it is making a transcription bubble, which is very similar to the replication fork. And in order to access the DNA, you have to unwind that duplex, right? So just like DNA poles have an associated helicase that helps to open up the DNA, the RNA polymerase actually does this for itself. So it generates a positive supercoil ahead of the transcription bubble and a negative supercoil behind it. And so that helps to open up the DNA and maintain it in that open state. And then the RNA polymerase can just kind of slide along and do what it does. There's some relief of the strain of this transcription bubble through topoisomerases, just like in DNA replication. You're going to hear me say just like DNA replication probably a lot. And one of the reasons is I want to draw your attention to the similarities between these two processes. This is definitely something that you'll need to be familiar with, how to compare and contrast DNA replication and um, transcription. So let's talk about template and non-template strands because with RNA transcription, we're only taking one of the DNA strands and making an, a complementary RNA. So the template strand is the DNA strand that serves as a template for RNA synthesis. The non-template strand is also called the coding strand and that's the one that is identical to the sequence of the transcribed RNA. The only difference is that in the RNA, you've got uracil. So you can see that the RNA transcript is in green, and it is an exact match to the coding strand, which is at the very top. So the ribosome is going to bind the template strand, and it's going to make the complementary RNA transcript that looks like the coding strand. 
There are six subunits that constitute the RNA polymerase holoenzyme. And again, we're talking about E. coli for right now. There's a sigma subunit that directs the RNA pole to a specific DNA binding site. So there's different variants that have different molecular weights. And so the 70, sigma 70, that's the molecular weight of the subunit. The, it's also the most common one, but there are other variants that have different molecular weights that will um, direct the RNA polymerase machinery to other places. Another difference about RNA polymerases is that they actually don't have separate proofreading exonuclease activity. So they actually have a higher error rate. But when you think about it, it doesn't matter as much if there's a higher error rate in making our RNA because the RNA isn't going to be around for very long in comparison to the DNA in your cell, which is there forever until that cell dies. So the integrity of the RNA doesn't matter quite as much. So RNA synthesis begins at a promoter. Think about kind of the what the equivalent would be in DNA replication. So I'm just going to try to throw in some of the different questions that you might encounter to help you think about the similarities and differences. So a promoter is a specific sequence in the DNA that RNA polymerase binds to. And then that polymerase is going to transcribe the adjacent segment of DNA, so all the genes. The sequence of promoters is variable, and promoter regions extend between positions minus 70 and plus 30. So whenever you see a minus, that means that it's before the promoter. Or sorry, not before the promoter. It is the promoter. Before the gene that you actually want to transcribe. So that's the minus. And if it's a plus, that means it's within the gene or after the start side. So it comes after the first um, nucleotide that is within the gene that you want to transcribe. That is a, a common thing that you'll see in terms of referring to DNA. So it gives you a, an idea of where you are. So remember, consensus sequences are just sequences that have, you know, common, you can see them in proteins, so it's common amino acids. Same thing with nucleotides. So you can see certain nucleotides that are particularly common at a specific position. And at around the minus 10 region, you tend to see this sequence. At a, around the minus 35, you see this sequence. You don't need to memorize these sequences, but you should have an idea that around the minus 10 region and the minus 35 region, there are some sequences that are, they're consensus sequences that help direct RNA polymerase binding. There's also the upstream promoter or the up element. And that's just an AT rich recognition element between minus 40 and minus 60. And you see it in some really highly expressed genes. And this is bound by the alpha subunit of the RNA polymerase. Again, we're still talking about E. coli. So make sure that that's ingrained in your mind. This is E. coli. It is a simpler system. We're going to talk about the eukaryotic system later on. So this is a figure showing promoter recognition. Remember that the sigma, the sigma subunit helps to recognize the promoter. We're going to talk about sigma 70 primarily here, but there are other sigma subunits. In A, we're looking at the DNA. All promoter regions will not have this up element 
but if it does it's going to be further upstream of the start site than the um, the minus 35 and minus 10 regions so these two regions here the minus 35 and the minus 10 you can think about the RNA polymerase almost putting a foot down on each one you know or like a finger down on each one in B what we're looking at is a structure of the RNA polymerase with the promoter just to help you have a better idea of what it looks like there's a channel that the DNA goes through and there's a channel that the RNA comes out of and we'll talk about how this works in just a second before we get to talking about the process of transcription we need to talk about footprinting so footprinting is a technique to find a DNA binding site for a protein. So you can identify sequences that are bound by a particular protein. And it's really, really helpful when you're dealing with a protein that binds specific DNA sequences and you want to figure out where it is, you know, and find some kind of consensus sequence. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to have DNA fragments that are labeled at one end of the strand. It's going to be double-stranded DNA. And then you're pretty much just going to chew it up some. You're going to make some DNA fragments. Those fragments, you're going to be able to see those on a gel. So we're now talking about this right-hand side. DNA is one will chew up DNA. You're going to make various cut sites and you'll see it on a gel. That's going to be your control lane if you're looking at the far right. Then you're going to take the same double-stranded DNA that you have with your protein. So you've incubated your protein with this DNA and then you're going to cut up that DNA and only the places that are exposed to enzyme will be cleaved. So you'll make fragments, but there will be some regions that are protected. The protected regions you're not going to see on the gel. So you compare the bands that are missing in your your sample that has your DNA binding protein to the sample where you just cut up the DNA and the ones that are missing these are the bands that represent the binding sites for your protein you won't always see completely no bands sometimes it'll just be you know, fewer bands or lighter intensity. But as you can see in the far right gel, we've got a big gap here and a big gap here, suggesting that these are the regions protected by your protein. This is a very common technique when you're trying to identify where a protein binds on DNA or RNA. So now we can get back to talking about transcription. The polymerase binds to the promoter, and that is directed by the sigma factor that's bound. You form a closed complex where the DNA is still double-stranded, and then there's a conformational change that occurs that opens up the DNA. It's partially unwound near that minus 10 sequence, which is one of the places where the, DNA, the RNA polymerase binds. And this forms an open complex. Initiation causes a conformational change that converts that complex to the elongation form. And then the complex clears the promoter, which means that it moves away from the promoter and it starts actually transcribing RNA.
At some point, the sigma subunit dissociates after the polymerase has entered elongation. That sigma subunit is just there to guide the RNA pole to the promoter, and that's it. Another protein comes along that binds in the same spot as the sigma subunit, and it's com it binds competitively. So once that sigma subunit leaves, then the other protein, NUS A, can bind. It's going to be with the RNA pole while it elongates, and then afterwards, that NUS A is going to dissociate as well, and then the polymerase dissociates from the DNA. This is a figure that demonstrates just that very cycle that we just talked through. You've got your promoter region in purple, and that's where the RNA polymerase is going to bind. You initially form the closed complex where the DNA is still double-stranded. Then there's a conformational change that encourages the opening of that DNA. Transcription is initiated. You clear that promoter, and then you elongate. Somewhere along the way, the sigma subunit leaves, NUS A binds, and you have elongation occurring until NUS A dissociates. Your transcript also dissociates and your RNA pole dissociates. It can be recycled and you can do this whole process all over again at the same site or a different site. But oftentimes the polymerases are recycled before being degraded. We're going to talk about another sigma subunit, the sigma 32 subunit, and that is specific for heat shock promoters. RNA polymerase only binds these promoters when the sigma 70 is replaced with sigma 32. And the products of heat shock genes are made at higher levels when the cell is exposed to some kind of environmental stress, like heat. So the different subunits allows the cell to coordinate expression of different sets of genes to respond to different environments. So it could be this kind of stress or maybe we're having a lot of glucose and then all of a sudden there's lactose instead of glucose. So now you need a new set of genes to take in this particular fuel source and, you know, make energy. Again, we're still talking about bacteria. So bacteria will pretty much eat anything, right? And in the lab, you give them glucose, you can give them lactose, you can give them all kinds of sugars. In a real environment, in the real world environment, that's happening too. Bacteria are adjusting to fuel sources and they're turning on and turning off different gene sets to help them adjust to and thrive in their environment. Transcription is regulated just like everything else. And it's regulated at several levels. This is a pretty big deal. We're spending a fair amount of energy to do this. So it needs to be regulated. Regulation can actually occur at any step of transcription. Binding to the RN the binding of the RNA polymerase to the promoter is the first committed step. So if you think about like when we talked about glycolysis, how the first committed step was the one that said, okay, now you're fitting to go through glycolysis. There's no other way around it. We cannot take this and do any other pathway. With RNA polymerase binding, it is a committed step. It is the, the beginning of transcription. And so that binding and initiation are very closely regulated. There are other proteins involved in this. So there are other proteins that can activate or repress transcription. One example of an activator is the cyclic AMP receptor protein, CRP. A, re a repressor would actually block RNA synthesis at specific genes. So CRP can bind the promoter region or somewhere upstream, and it will encourage RNA polymerase binding it can encourage the open conformation or the open complex to form. There are all types of ways that
um, activators can act on transcription. So we have this whole RNA transcript, right? We have to terminate RNA synthesis. There has to be some kind of a signal to tell the RNA polymerase to stop making the RNA transcript and to get off of the DNA. There's a couple of different types. The first type is rho independent terminators. So this is rho. And these have a self complementary region that forms a hairpin towards the end of the mRNA. A hairpin is just a secondary structure where there's some complementarity and you form a little bit of a double stranded uh, RNA piece and then there's a loop on top that does not have any complementarity. So that's a hairpin. These have a conserved string of three A residues that are transcribed into U residues near the end of the hairpin. Once the polymerase sees this um, structure here, it says, oh, okay, I should get off now. And part of the reason it's thought that the hairpin can't actually interact with the DNA to form that RNA-DNA hybrid as well. And that's part of what keeps the RNA polymerase tied to the DNA. So if you lose some of that interaction, then the RNA polymerase is more likely to fall off. Then there's rho-dependent terminators. Rho is a protein factor that has an ATPase activity and a helicase activity. So it is specific for RNA-DNA hybrids. What it does is it kind of scans along the mRNA and separates it from the DNA template. So it breaks up that RNA-DNA hybrid. And there is some kind of a sequence called the RUT, the row utilization element that will allow the helicase to bind and then scan, but how it actually helps facilitate the release of the mRNA from the DNA and terminate transcription is still a little bit of a mystery. But it happens. And that's how you know science is still ongoing, right? There are still a lot of questions that we have that are not answered. Now let's move on to eukaryotic cells. The trend is more complicated, more proteins, usually bigger proteins. Eukaryotes have three nuclear RNA polymerases. So one difference that I should definitely mention is that bacteria, since they don't have a nucleus, their DNA is not compartmentalized, everything happens in the same bowl of soup. In eukaryotic cells, we have nuclei. And within the nucleus, that's where you're making this messenger RNA. And it is exported into the cytosol for translation. So we've got three nuclear RNA polymerases, one, two, and three. And each of them has a function that is specific to it. And it's recruited to a specific promoter sequence. So pole one, preribosomal RNA. Pole two mRNAs and non-coding RNAs, pole 3 tRNAs, 5S ribosomal RNA, and more non-coding RNAs. So whenever you think about biology class and transcription, you're usually talking about pole 2 because we focus a lot on messenger RNA transcription. However, pole 1 and pole 3 are very, very important because if you don't have a ribosome, then you can't really do much else. Um, you can't make that protein. Non-coding RNAs have a variety of functions that are necessary for the cell to survive. So we focus very heavily on messenger RNA, but there are lots of other areas where 
messenger RNA just isn't even a topic because it's the other RNAs that are catalytic RNAs that are structural RNAs and things of that nature that are very important to homeostasis and regulation. So pole one, again, it makes pre-ribosomal RNA. It contains the precursors for all the different parts except for the 5S. And we're going to talk about ribosomes when we do protein metabolism, so don't worry. That will make more sense later. RNA pole 2, mRNAs, non-coding RNAs, and it can recognize a lot of different promoters. Some pole 2 promoters have common sequences. You've probably heard of the TATA box, and that's the consensus sequence near the minus 30. And there's also an initiator sequence at the plus one. However, most promoter regions don't look like that at all. So there is all different types of promoters that pole two has to recognize. And we'll see how this problem is solved because having one protein recognize all these different um, promoter regions might be a little bit problematic. There's also regulatory sequences that can be upstream of that, and those regulatory sequences vary quite a lot as well. Pole 3, primarily for tRNAs, it also makes the 5S rRNA and other non-coding RNAs. Now we're going to focus on pole 2. We've got to talk about mRNA, right? So pole 2 is much more complex than its bacterial counterpart. But the overall structure, function, and mechanism are conserved. And this, again, is a very common theme in these major processes like DNA replication, RNA transcription. RBP1 subunit, very high degree of homology to the bacterial uh, beta prime subunit. And you don't need to know these individual subunits. This is just for those that are interested in structures. As long as you have the understanding that pole 2 in eukaryotes is analogous to, you know, the bacterial RNA polymerase and that they're similar in structure, function, and mechanism, you're good to go. But this is just to show that there are subunits within the RNA polymerase in bacteria that are similar to the subunits that are in eukaryotes. That's it. Now there is one difference, a major difference, and that is the carboxyl terminal domain, or the CTD. It's a long tail in RBP1 that has a lot of repeats of a consensus heptad amino acid sequence. And this is the sequence. Lots of serines, there's threonine in there. Yeast enzymes have 26 repeats. Human and mouse enzymes have 52. It's separated from the main body of the enzyme by a disordered linker sequence. So that allows for the, the tail to be exposed or to not be exposed. And that tail has a lot of areas where it can be phosphorylated and it has a, it's pretty much the runway for other machinery to bind. And we'll talk about that as we talk about transcription. Transcription factors. You can think about um, the sigma subunit in E. coli as almost like a transcription factor because it helps direct the polymerase to the promoter. In eukaryotes, we have a ton of transcription factors. And there are just a wide variety of proteins that work with pole 2 to activate the whole complex. Then there's general transcription factors that are required at every pole 2 promoter, along with some, you know, special ones that are only at different, you know, specific promoters. So we're going to focus on the general transcription factors here. Here is a whole list of proteins that are required for initiation of uh, transcription at pole 2 promoters. You don't need to know the number of subunits or their molecular weights, but you do need to know the relative order of binding, which we're going to talk about 
and their relative, um, you know, what they do, generic functionality. So this is a good kind of catch-all table to know. So now we're going to get to the nuts and bolts of it. We've got this promoter region. We've got our ideal Tata box and initiator regions, which is not very common, but we'll go with it. The first thing that's going to bind is the Tata binding protein. And sometimes that brings along with it TF2D. Sometimes it binds on its own. But the first two things that are going to bind is the Tata binding protein and transcription factor 2D. So transcription factors usually are designated with a TF, and that's transcription factor. Then it tells you the polymerase that it works with. This one works with pole 2, so there's a 2. And then we've got a letter, A through, like, F. And then there's H, there's... There's a lot of them. So, we've got our TATA binding protein and our TF2D bound. The next thing that we're going to bring in, use a different color, is usually TF2A. A and B sometimes come together. And then you'll have TF2F that also brings along with it the polymerase. So pole 2 usually is recruited along with TF2F. The last thing that binds is the TF2E and TF2H complex. TF2H is a helicase, and TF2E is kind of like a clamp. Once all of these things assemble on that promoter region, you have what's called the pre-initiation complex, or the PIC. And it's closed. TF2H, as I mentioned, has a helicase functionality to it, and it will help to unwind the DNA in the initiator region. Now we've got an open initiation complex. Once that happens and we form that transcription bubble, transcription initiates, and the first thing that we do is we release TF2E and TF2H. During initiation, there's also phosphorylation of that CTD on RBP1 on pole 2. The phosphorylation state of that domain changes. It is dynamic throughout the transcription process. But phosphorylation is required for this whole complex to escape the promoter or to clear the promoter. Once that happens, you're now in the elongation phase. Elongation is just the same as, you know, when you're replicating the DNA and you're just adding nucleotide after nucleotide. Same thing here. So we're going along, we're making our transcript, and then eventually the elongation factors which I don't think I mentioned that. So once you enter the, once TF2E and TF2H dissociate, there are elongation factors that bind that promote the, uh, the pole to, to stay on the DNA and continue making that RNA transcript. Eventually, those elongation factors will fall away and termination factors will bind. that CTD domain is dephosphorylated as transcription terminates. So it's one of the signals, hey, all right, it's time to stop. 
once that happens, and there's a lot more that goes on here that we're going to talk about, then you release your transcript and you release the poll to and all of its friends. And that whole complex can be recycled to go and do the process all over again. So now we're going to talk a little bit more closely about some of the different um, some of the different pieces of the transcription process. So if this is repetitive, I'm sorry, but I really want to make sure that you understand um, each step and the importance of all these different proteins. So we're starting again with the assembly of the RNA pole and all of its friends, the transcription factors at the promoter. You form a pre-initiation complex or a PIC and it contains all of these different proteins, T, uh, TATA binding protein, TF2A, B, D, E, F, and H, along with pole 2 TF2D, like I said, it, it binds very early on. Sometimes the TATA binding protein can bind and then recruit TF2D, but sometimes they kind of bind together. And the structure for TF2D shows that it has this kind of elongated um, structure that allows for the building of a scaffold. So the TBP can bind and then it will provide a place for the other transcription factors and POL2 to bind. So it kind of straddles both ends of that initiator sequence. So think about what you might see if a gene were actively being transcribed. If you did a footprinting experiment, would you be able to see, you know, the promoter region protected or would it be unprotected? So think about that in terms of um, think about protected DNA, protected RNA versus unprotected and what that would look like with the footprinting experiment. That'll definitely be a question. TF2H promotes unwinding, so it's got a helicase activity. It requires ATP, so we've seen this in DNA replication as well. This is one of the reasons why replication and transcription are so heavily regulated. They use a lot of energy. We're using up a lot of resources to do this. But that helicase activity promotes the unwinding of the DNA and we create that open complex so we can initiate transcription. It also has a kinase activity. So remember that the CTD has to be phosphorylated for RBP1. And TF2H has kinase activity that will phosphorylate a lot of places on that CTD. There are other kinases that also phosphorylate um, the CTD as well. But TF2H is definitely critical here because it helps with creating that initial, um, the initiation complex. Phosphorylation causes a conformational change for the overall complex to help initiate transcription. So other kinases phosphorylate it, but you also really need TF2H to do it too. Pole 2 will enter elongation after TF2E and TF2H are released. So you make a little bit of the transcript, about 60 to 70 nucleotides, and then those two factors leave. The phosphorylation state of the CTD is dynamic. And so you don't see all of the repeats here, but you may see more um, phosphorylation as time goes on and the phosphorylation is a signal for different factors to be able to bind to the CTD to help process the RNA transcript as it's being made. There are elongation factors that bind to RNA polymerase after TF2E and H leave and that enhances processivity. So just like DNA polymerases RNA polymerases have to be processive. You can't really pick up and start again because you're making a transcript that is not a part of 
it that RNA transcript would just be released out into the wild. So that's very wasteful. We have to be highly processive and make the entire transcript before the RNA pole can fall off. The elongation factors also help to coordinate post-translational modifications. So RNAs are heavily modified before they actually reach the cytosol. During termination, we get rid of those, phosphorylate, uh, those phosphoryl groups and all of the machinery is recycled to do the whole mess again. Because making RNA transcripts is so important, it is the center of the central dogma, RNA polymerases are drug targets. So there's actinomycin D, which is an antibiotic that inhibit, inhibits RNA elongation in both bacteria and eukaryotes. So clearly not something that you would want to use on a person, but if you're doing experiments in the lab to try to understand these processes or understand um, you know, what is linked to the process of transcription in bacteria or eukaryotes, then it's a great tool. What it does is it intercalates into the double helix of the DNA and it prevents polymerase movement because when you deform that duplex of DNA, the RNA polymerase can't really, it gets stuck. So it can't make the transcript. There's also rifampin, which is an antibiotic that inhibits bacterial RNA synthesis and it prevents promoter clearance. So this has been used in the treatment of tuberculosis, but as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of cases of drug-resistant tuberculosis. And drug-resistant tuberculosis, these bacteria have mutations in their um, RNA polymerase where the rifampin binds. So this is a, a structure showing the drug, and then there's a lot of amino acids in this region that interact with the antibiotic and allow it to bind. But if you mutate these, then you reduce the association of the antibiotic with the polymerase. So you're no longer blocking um, promoter clearance. So that is a huge issue, and there is still a search for new antibiotics to treat these um, drug-resistant tuberculosis cases. Death cat mushrooms, I mean, death is in the name of their, part of the common name. So clearly, watch out. This is one of the reasons why you should not go foraging for mushrooms in the woods unless you absolutely know what you're doing, because these are lethal to animals. Um, alpha amanitin is a compound that's produced by these mushrooms and it blocks transcription. So that's really bad. It'll block pole two and at really high concentrations, it'll block pole three. And a lethal dose is super, super small, like a little teeny tiny nibble, like a mouse nibble worth is lethal to humans. So very potent stuff. Mushrooms can be dangerous. Just stick to the grocery store and, and be okay. Mushrooms are great, but they can be really, really dangerous. So we talked about the process of transcription, but now we need to talk about some of the other things that happen to RNA. Because RNAs, when we talked about nucleic acids as a whole, RNAs are very susceptible to being degraded. So we've got to protect RNAs once they're made from all of the nucleases in the cell. Pretty much all eukaryotic RNAs and lots of bacterial RNAs undergo processing. Processing could mean adding or deleting nucleotide sequences, chemical modifications like adding methyl groups and things of that nature, degradation, so getting rid of some of the nucleotides, 
And ribozymes can actually catalyze some of these post-transcriptional processing steps. There's something called RNA splicing, which you've probably heard of, and it sounds very much like mad scientist, but it happens in all of us, and it is necessary for eukaryotes. So let's introduce some terminology, and then we'll talk about what splicing is. You have the primary or the precursor transcript, and that's the newly synthesized RNA molecule, the nascent RNA. That's what the substrate is for RNA splicing. Within that molecule, you have introns and exons. The introns are non-coding tracks that break up the coding regions. The coding regions are the exons. So most genes have introns for humans. And on average, you've got about eight introns per gene. The exons are the coding segments, and they're usually much smaller. So the coding pieces of mRNA are the exons. RNA splicing is the process that's used to remove the introns and splice together all of the exons so that they're continuous, and you will form a functional polypeptide at the end of the translation process. In addition to splicing, which we're not going to talk about all of the machinery that um, that does this job, I just feel like that's just too much. We've already got a lot to cover. So if you're interested in the spliceosome, by all means, go ahead and read about it in your book. But you're not going to be held responsible for all of the details. We're just going to kind of do a a sampling of all the different things that can happen to RNA once it's been made. So eukaryotic messenger RNAs are modified on both the 5' prime end and the 3' prime end. At the 5' prime end, there's a 5' prime cap that's a modified guanine. At the 3' prime end, you have what's called a poly A tail that's added. And that's... Um, a tail that has just this long string of adenosines. So let's put all of this together. We always think about things as happening in a linear form. First we make the whole transcript, then we add the cap, then we, you know, take out all of the introns, then we string it together. But the truth is, a lot of these processes are happening kind of all at once. And again, that uh, CTD domain of pole 2 it is another scaffold for all of these processing enzymes and um, complexes to bind, do what they do, and then leave. These complexes also usually interact with each other. So the transcript, the capping um, enzymes associate at the same time that you may have um, the spliceosome coming in and doing its job to take out the introns. So these things are happening all at the same time. And then there's also the enzymes that add the, the poly A tail. Those hang out at the CTD as well. So all this stuff is kind of happening together to protect the messenger RNA. That's the, that's the primary goal of all of this processing. It's to protect the RNA and to, you know, get it into its functional form in terms of taking out all the introns. So we have what's called the messenger ribonuclear protein complex, the mRNP. You don't just have a nascent mRNA shipped out of the nucleus alone. There are lots of proteins involved in mRNA transport to the cytoplasm that are associated with the mRNA in the nucleus, and they help to get it out to the cytoplasm so that it can reach a ribosome for translation. <laughs> 
processing of the transcript is coupled to its transport. So when we say the messenger ribonucleotide or ribonucleoprotein complex, the mRNP, we're talking about lots of proteins. It is very dynamic. And we're talking about dozens of proteins with multiple subunits that associate with the transcript. The composition of this complex changes over time as the transcript is processed. And then when it's ready for transport and when it's delivered to the ribosome. So don't think about it as just the static ball of proteins and RNA that, you know, moves from the nucleus to the ribosome. Not at all the case. There are different complexes coming and going. It is a very dynamic process because all of these different steps require different proteins. So let's talk about the five prime end first. We're going to talk about the cap. The five prime cap is a seven methyl guanosine that's linked to the five prime terminal residue of the mRNA. And it's got a weird five prime, five prime triphosphate linkage. So the five prime carbon of the, um, of the sugar is linked to phosphates, which are then linked to the other, the, the following residues, five prime carbon. And that's just a weird linkage. It's only for the cap. The function of the cat is one, to protect mRNA from ribonucleases. They don't really digest the cap very well. So it prevents the mRNAs from being chewed up really quickly. The cap also has specific cap binding complexes that will bind to it. And it participates in having that mRNA actually bind to the ribosome when it reaches the cytoplasm so it can be translated into protein. We said that introns and exons are part of the pre-mRNA transcript and that humans we generally have about on average eight introns per gene. Most genes in vertebrates contain introns one exception being histones, which we haven't talked about what histones are, but histones are the proteins that your DNA are wrapped around. In eukaryotes, exons are usually less than 1,000 base pairs long, but introns can actually be very, very long, which is kind of ironic. It seems a little bit wasteful, I know. The human genome has hundreds of thousands of introns spread across like 20,000 genes. So introns are everywhere. There's four different classes of introns. Group one and two are self-splicing. Then we've got the spliceosome introns, which are removed by the spliceosome. Go figure, right? And then there's protein catalyzed introns that um, are removed by enzymes. So we're talking about proteins here. But it is interesting that RNA helps to process RNA. And that is one of the things that um, contributes to the whole RNA world hypothesis, which we're not going to get into that. That's kind of the last section of this chapter. And if you're interested in it, by all means, go ahead. But the idea is that RNA was like the beginning of the living world in terms of being able to replicate itself, do chemistry like proteins do. So it's like the beginning of everything. And I mean, hey, who knows, right? So in terms of what you're responsible for with splicing, understand the, the four different groups. But you don't need to know... Um, you know, like the cellular location and all that stuff. Just have a basic understanding of the different groups, um, their components. So is it a catalytic RNA? Is it a protein? Is it a mixture? That kind of thing.
So the spliceosome carries out nuclear pre-mRNA splicing. Spliceosome introns are the most common in eukaryotes. We don't really have the whole cell splicing thing going on. Bacteria do, um, but we don't. Some splicing apparatus components are tethered to that CTD portion of RNA pole too. Again, that CTD is a place of it is it's popping. It is very popular. Okay, so splicing and all the other post transcriptional modifications are very tightly linked with transcription itself. So we're going to talk a little bit more detail about the spliceosome. This is the only one that we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk about all the other um, ways that you can take out an intron. But the spliceosome is a really big complex. It's got very special RMP complexes called SNRPs, small nuclear ribonuclear proteins, which I know. This does not look like it should be pronounced SNRP, but trust me, it is. It's also got dozens of other proteins, so this is a very big complex. And small nuclear RNAs are 1 to 200 nucleotide RNAs that make up SNRPs. So it's these RNAs plus all the proteins. So these different RNAs, U1, 2, 4, 5, and 6, are abundant in the nucleus. There are proteins that catalyze the splicing of tRNAs. We're not really going to go too heavy into that, but I'm mentioning it here just because tRNAs are so important. So tRNAs and some mRNAs are um, spliced in this manner. There are endonucleases that cleave um, at both ends of the intron and liberate it. And then there's a ligase that joins the two exons together. And there you go. So we've covered so far the five prime cap. We've talked a little bit about splicing to get rid of the introns and bring together all of the exons. Now we've got to talk about the three prime end and that's where the poly A tail is added. So it's a string of A residues is added to most of the eukaryotic mRNAs that undergo translation. In us, it's somewhere between 50 and 100 a residues added at the end. It's a binding site for proteins, but it also might help protect mRNA from enzymatic destruction. So think about it. If you just had the gene itself, and then there is a ribonuclease that was like, mm, you know, I'm hungry, and it starts to chew it up from the three prime end, then if there's no poly A tail, then you're just going to destroy your message. If there's a poly A tail, while it is important as a binding site for specific proteins, you may be able to just elongate that tail again because there are enzymes to do that. And instead of chewing up your message, you're just chewing up that poly A tail. So the poly A tail is a little bit more expendable than the message itself. So there's an endonuclease that cleaves at the poly A addition site. So on the mRNA, there is a site that um, says, hey, come to me, bind here, and cleave here to make space for the poly A tail. So there's this AAU, AAA sequence that's highly conserved. And the polyadenylation factors will hang out there. And then, once the ribosome leaves, you're going to have that endonuclease activity, which remember an endonuclease is just something that cuts at a specific sequence on nucleic acid. It's going to cut, and then you have polyadenylate polymerase that's going to add on that long string of A's. This is just an overview slide of mRNA processing. So this is a good one to talk through about how you get from the DNA to the mature RNA that has a five prime cap 
All of the exons are in a row, no, en no introns to in sight, poly A tail, etc. So why do we have introns? It seems a little bit ridiculous and it seems a little bit extra. But the reason is because if you have introns, then you can have alternate splicing where you can incorporate an exon or not incorporate an exon and you can have many different gene products from one gene. So when you can create different polypeptides, you can have an increased variety in the polypeptides that you have in the cell without having additional um, genetic material. So you don't have to have, you know, one gene for every single protein that you want to make. You maybe can make two or three different proteins for one gene segment. This actually occurs, alternative splicing, in like most of human genes. So it is very, very common. The pre-mRNA contains a signal for all of the alternative processing pathways. And RNA binding proteins will promote one path versus another. So you could imagine how binding, you know, if you cover up one site that, you know, the spliceosome may not have access to it, so it's not going to take out, you know, this exon or that intron. Complex transcripts can have more than one site where a poly A tail can form. So this is so that in, let's say, figure A, we've got a five prime splice site, and then we've got a couple of three prime splice sites and a poly A site, right? Well, in this one, we've only got the one poly A site. So we have to include number four. Otherwise, we won't have a complete transcript. So we can cut out two, we can cut out two and three, but we have to have four to, in order to have a poly A tail. But let's say that we have two poly A sites, one between one and two and another between two and three. Well, that means that we can make a transcript that is just one, or we can make a transcript that's one and two. So these transcripts are very complex and which gene product gets made is based on the conditions of the cell and the needs of the cell. So alternative processing can actually be responsible for making two different proteins in two different places of the body. So this is an example in rats. There's a gene that exists in both the thyroid and the brain. However, there's alternative splicing and using a different poly A site that has two different proteins appear in these two different um, areas of the body. So in the thyroid, you have exons 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that mature transcript goes on to make calcitonin. However, in the brain of rats, instead of including four, you get rid of it. And so you have one, two, three, five, and six. And instead, you make this calcitonin-related um, protein. So these are both hormones and you get different hormones based on alternative splicing, a different poly A site, and then some protease action to, um, you know, chew up the unnecessary parts of the protein and make this hormone. Same gene, two very different gene products. Related, but significantly different. Now we're going to talk about RNA-dependent synthesis of RNA and DNA. So we talked about DNA-dependent, now we're going to talk about RNA-dependent. Why is this important? Because viruses. Reverse transcriptase is 
an RNA dependent DNA polymerase. So it needs RNA as a template and it will make DNA. There are RNA viruses called retroviruses that require these reverse transcriptases to work. So genetic information can flow backwards from RNA to DNA. We think about DNA as being the center of everything, but research in the last like 40 years or so has really shown that RNA is really where it's at. So reverse transcriptase catalyzes the conversion of viral RNA to double-stranded RNA, which can then be integrated into the host genome, where it will be forever because it's going to be replicated every time the cell divides. So what happens here is you have a retrovirus that is coded. It's got an envelope. That's what these blue and green circles are. And inside of that envelope, you have an integrase, reverse transcriptase, and protease, along with the RNA genome. There's also a tRNA from like a prior infection that comes along for the ride that's necessary for initiation of the reverse transcriptase. So once this virus makes contact with the plasma membrane and convinces it to let it dump out its contents, you're releasing viral DNA and you're releasing all of the other proteins that I mentioned earlier, the integrase, the reverse transcriptase, etc. And what happens is you use the viral, the, the viral proteins will be used to make viral DNA. So you take the reverse transcriptase, the RNA genome, you end up making DNA that is complementary to the RNA, and then you get rid of the RNA and replace it with DNA so that you have double-stranded viral DNA. The integrase will integrate this into the host chromosome. And then whenever that region is transcribed, you end up making that viral transcript, which gets exported into the cytoplasm, just like all other messenger RNAs are. And you create more of the proteins that are necessary to assemble a new virus. So the virus is actually taking advantage of all the resources of the host cell to make and package more virus. And then eventually all of this virus will break out. It's going to break open the cell and kill it essentially. And now you've got a bunch more virus released into the body where it can go and do the same thing. Now let's talk a little bit more detail. We saw some little letters that indicate some genes. So GAG is what encodes the proteins of the interior viral core. So if we go back just for a second, these blue circles, so it's part of that envelope that holds it all together. Pole is the protease that cleaves the long polypeptide that is made. So again, to go back, I usually don't do this, but these two slides really work together. You have this DNA, and it's when it's transcribed, you make this long transcript. And when you do that, you actually make a very long polypeptide. And what the protease does is it recognizes certain sites and it will chop it up so that you have all of the different proteins that you need to make your new virus package. ENV, that encodes the proteins of the viral envelope. And then there's a long terminal repeat sequence that's at both ends of the viral DNA that facilitates 
integration into the host DNA. It's pretty sneaky stuff. Like, low-key, viruses are... I mean, I have an appreciation for them. Can't say that I necessarily like them because they can make you very sick. But it's some pretty great, like, I mean, you're taking over this whole big old organism with this tiny little envelope of stuff. Like, just think about that. You're a whole entire person and a few packets of this virus can shut you down. Not saying that I want to be shut down by a virus. However, just the idea that something that small can have such a huge effect on an, a big organism like a human or like an elephant or something, I think that that's just mind boggling. Anyway, let's look at the structure and the gene products of the genome. So again, we've got all of these different genes all in a row that we talked about that we need to make the envelope and to um, allow the new virus that's made to be able to make new virus. So we have to have the, the gene for the protease and everything else. So the primary transcript is pretty long and it gets translated and then there's cleavage so that you make all the structural proteins to make the envelope and keep the virus together in one package and all of the enzymes that you need when that virus first fuses with the plasma membrane and dumps out its contents and gets to work. Now we're going to focus on the reverse transcriptase and what it does. It actually does three reactions, which is pretty impressive. It catalyzes RNA-dependent DNA synthesis. So it takes the viral RNA and converts that to DNA. And the result of that is an RNA DNA hybrid. Then it degrades the RNA. So we get rid of that. And now we're just left with um, single stranded. Getting excited here. Single stranded DNA. Then it takes that DNA and makes a complement to that single strand. I just keep wanting to write RNA for some reason, every time. So again, to recap, because to me, this is one of the things that was, when I first learned about this all those many moons ago, I was just like, so wait a minute. You're going to tell me that this one enzyme can take viral RNA, make a DNA transcript that is complementary. Then it goes and chews up the RNA so that you have single-stranded DNA. Then it makes a complement to that so you have double-stranded DNA. That is mind-blowing. That is a lot of work for one enzyme to do. The DNA synthesis part requires a primer. So remember that tRNA that is associated with the viral RNA genome? That's a requirement. And it gets that from a previous infection. Reverse transcriptases don't have proofreading. They do a lot of things, but they don't have proofreading. So their error rate can be as high as about 1 in 20,000 nucleotides. But if you think about it, that's part of, that's not really a bad thing for the virus because mutation introduces ways of evolving. So if you think about the coronavirus um, 
and how SARS-CoV-2 has been mutating over time, part of that is because every time it is replicating its genome, it's introducing what we might call mistakes, but it's calling evolution. And eventually, you're going to make it to a mistake that confers some kind of advantage. And it takes a lot of errors and a lot of mutation to actually find something that sticks and gives an, an advantage that allows that particular strain to overcome and become the, uh, the most abundant of a particular virus. So when you think about, um, you know, COVID-19 and how you see all of these different uh, strains, you've got the Delta now and there's like Delta had a baby. So that's what's going on here. We've got mutation happening because so many people are getting infected. And even if you don't have symptoms, the virus is still reproducing in your body and it's making new virus particles that you're breathing out onto everyone. And those mutations are being propagated to the next person and the next person and the next person. So even if you don't, even if you're asymptomatic, you can still contribute to the evolution of the virus to where it may break out and it can infect people that are vaccinated. So that's just a word to the wise. Uh, vaccination is great, but it is not 100% guarantee that you are safe because we don't know about the appearance of a new strain until it has taken over. And that's a really dangerous place to be. It's kind of like we're, we're behind the eight ball in that game. Anyway, moving on. Reverse transcriptases are actually really important. So they permit the synthesis of a DNA complementary to an mRNA template. And you can use these to um, clone cellular genes. So making a cDNA library, you can use a reverse transcriptase to do it. Some retroviruses actually cause cancer. And most of you probably know um, that HIV is a retrovirus that causes AIDS. So some retroviruses contain an oncogene that causes the cell to grow abnormally, which is what cancer is. These are classified as RNA tumors. And there are several examples, but one of them is the Roos sarcoma virus. It's also called the avian sarcoma virus. But it's pretty much just a virus that enables the cell to grow abnormally. There's also human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. And this is one that, again, everybody knows what this is. And it causes acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. It actually kills many of the cells that it infects, unlike other viruses. Um, this leads to suppression of the host immune system. And then because of that, you can get really sick from things that normally wouldn't make you as sick and then you can die from something like the flu or you know you may be prone to getting pneumonia or you know from from a bacteria that most people don't get pneumonia from like things like that the reverse transcriptase of HIV is very error prone and at least one error occurs every time the genome is re replicated so there's lots of proteins here. Um, you can look at the viral genome here. And there's lots of structural proteins. You've got the protease, the envelope proteins, all of those things. So when you're introducing all those errors, it makes it really difficult to keep up and to try to develop something that can target HIV. There is um, AZT, azithromycin that is a deoxythymidine analog that has been used to fight AIDS. It turns into AZT triphosphate inside of the T lymphocytes, and it doesn't really get, um, other cell types don't really take it up as well. And also 
cellular, so the host human um, polymerases don't really like it too much. So the AZT binding to the viral polym uh, polymerase, or excuse me, uh, reverse transcriptase, it actually binds that better than the host polymerases, which is necessary because otherwise it would be very toxic. So it binds to HIV reverse transcriptase competitively, um, and it inhibits deoxythymidine binding. So it makes it makes it so that the DNA synthesis is terminated. Once you incorporate AZT, you can't incorporate any more um, nucleotides to extend the strand. There's also dideoxyinosine that has a similar effect, very similar mechanism of action. Telomerase is also a reverse transcriptase, and you may have heard of telomeres in your biology class. So telomeres are structures at the end of linear eukaryotic chromosomes. And they're not very easily replicated because cellular DNA polymerases, uh, they don't have a, a template. There's no RNA template or primer for those regions. So we can't easily replicate it. Telomerases are ribonucleoproteins that synthesize the telomeres at the end of your chromosomes. So what they actually do is they make their own primer. They make an RNA primer, and then they use that primer to extend and extend and extend. So that's kind of a cool um, mechanism as well there's an internal RNA with a repeat of C and A, and it's a certain number of C's, a certain number of A's. And that serves as a template for synthesizing the opposite strand. There's also these T-loop structures, and these structures are single strands that kind of loop back around at the end. And this protects the three prime end of the chromosome from nucleases and enzymes that repair double stranded breaks. You don't want that happening um, willy nilly on your chromosomes. So that looping around makes it so that the, the nucleases can't actually bind and attack. There are also proteins associated with um, the telomeres as well that uh, help to form the duplex that help to you know form that whole loop structure so telomeres are really important um, they make it so that when you replicate your DNA you're not leaving off parts of genes so telomeres don't encode anything they don't have like useful gene products therefore if you don't copy the whole thing it's okay because you don't need that part to make functional gene products. So we just did a, an overview of chapter 26. We kind of jumped through a lot of different topics there. And in class, we'll be able to do some case studies and bring it all together. So make sure that, again, don't focus on the things that were not covered in this lecture that are in the textbook because you're not going to be quizzed on it. So don't worry your little brain about it. Just focus on the things that we talked about. I'm sure that's enough. Until I see you in class, stay safe.